Have you ever experienced a moment in your life that was so painful and confusing that all you wanted to do was learn as much as you could to make sense of it all? When I was 13, a close family friend, who was like an uncle to me, passed from pancreatic cancer. When the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more, so I went online to find answers. Using the internet, I found a variety of statistics on pancreatic cancer, and what I had found shocked me. Over 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. Why are we so bad at detecting pancreatic cancer? The reason? Our current modern medicine is a 60-year-old technique. I mean, that's older than my dad. <laughs> but also, it costs $800 per test and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all pancreatic cancers. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously, ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. Learning this, I was sure there had to be a better way. So once again, I went back online, and I found what a sensor for pancreatic cancer would really have to look like to be effective. A sensor would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. Now, there's a reason why we haven't updated this test in over six decades. And that's because when we're looking for these different cancers, we're looking in your bloodstream, particularly for these certain proteins that are found at different levels. And while this sounds really straightforward, it's anything but. Essentially, you have these liters and liters of healthy blood, but these are already abundant in protein. And looking for this tiny increase in this tiny amount of this one protein is next to impossible. It's kind of like trying to find a needle in a stack of nearly identical needles. However, undeterred due to my teenage optimism and not knowing anything about biomedicine, <laughs> I went to ch a, a teenager's really only source for information, Google and Wikipedia, how I get through every high school test. And essentially, I found a database of over 8,000 different proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have these cancers. And I was just like, wow, that's, that's a lot of proteins. And so <laughs> I was just like, I'm going to get through all of these. It's kind of like I play this one game called Pokemon. It's like, got to catch them all, but got to find them all. And on the 4,000th try, I finally find one protein that might work. Also, I was close to losing my sanity, and I'd spent like three weeks at my computer, and my parents thought I had no social life, but that's how you do science, kind of. <laughs> the name of the protein I found was called mesotheon. And it's just your ordinary round-of-the-mill type protein, unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer, in which case it's found at these very high levels in your bloodstream. But also, What's so cool about it is that it's found the earliest stages of the disease, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So now that I had found a reliable protein to detect pancreatic cancer, I then shifted my focus to actually detecting this protein and thus the presence of pancreatic cancer. Now, my epiphany moment kind of came in the most unlikely of places, my high school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation, in my opinion. <laughs> You know how your teacher kind of like drones on and on? Yeah, that was, that was my biology teacher. She's just like, antibodies are very exciting. <laughs> but yeah, I kind of fell asleep in like all of her classes. But essentially, I'd, I'd like smuggled in this article on what are called carbon nanotubes. And these are long, thin pipes of carbon that are an atom thick and 150,000 diameter of your hair. And these are really, really small, but they have these amazing properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. And so then while I was sneakily reading this article under my desk, I was listening out of the corner of my ear about something that my biology teacher was saying about these things called antibodies. I was like, oh, psh, I already know about these antibodies. <laughs> but essentially what happened is antibodies are these molecules. They're really neat. They only react to one specific protein, in this case, the cancer biomarker. And so then I was just sitting in class, sneakily reading this article, when suddenly it hit me. These two things I was learning about could be combined. You weave, this network, you weave um, these antibodies into a network of nanotubes, such that you have a network that only reacts with one specific protein. 
But also what's so cool is due to the amazing properties of carbon nanotubes, how electricity flows through this network will actually change based on the amount of this one protein present. And thus, I could detect pancreatic cancer with a $50 ohmmeter I smuggled out from my dad's garage. However, there's a catch. These networks of nanotubes are extremely flimsy. And since they're so delicate, they need to be supported. So I chose to use paper. And making a paper sensor for cancer is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I personally love. I mean, who doesn't like chocolate chip cookies? Essentially, you start with some water, you pour in the nanotubes, you pour in some antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and you can detect cancer. How... <laughs> However, the one unfortunate thing is that I was 14 years old and I was still living at home. And my mom wasn't a big advocate of doing cancer research on my kitchen countertop. I mean, I mean I'd done some pretty crazy experiments, like I made like nitroglycerin explosives in my basement and mixed up E. coli where we make sandwiches, but cancer research was kind of pushing the line. <laughs> so I realized I might need a lab. So essentially, I contacted 200 different professors at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institutes of Health. Essentially, I kind of felt like a cyber stalker, like, you know, those people that go on Facebook and, like, look up every detail. Yeah, that was me and these professors. I was like, ooh, this person's interested in pancreatic cancer. Ooh. But... <laughs> <laughs> and they sent them this 32-page document detailing my plan for working in their lab. And then I sat back waiting for the positive emails to pour in, and I was going to be able to pick and choose my lab, and it was going to be great. Then reality took hold. Got over 199 rejections. And I realized that some professors aren't nearly as nice as their profile pictures make them seem. <laughs> However, despite all of this, I finally got one maybe, and that was enough for me. I was like, oh, that's a maybe. I can, I can go in that direction. So I finally go into this one professor's lab, Dr. Arnbad Maitra at Johns Hopkins, and bring these giant blue ring binders, trying to impress him with these 500 plus journal articles I had accumulated. Go in, slam them down on his desk, not the best way to like really introduce yourself, but he peers over and he's like, so tell me about your project. And as soon as I start, he starts calling in more and more of these PhDs from the lab. And soon enough, there's like 20 PhDs plus me and the professor in this like tiny space that's like as big as a circle here. I'm like, wow, I didn't know many, how many PhDs you could fit in here. How many PhDs can you fit in that lab? <laughs> but um, essentially, they started an the interrogation and they're firing these rapid fire questions at me, trying to sync my procedure. However, I got through, I answered all the questions. I guessed on quite a few. I always guess C, just like I do on SATs. And I finally landed the lab space I needed. And as soon as I started working, I realized immediately, pretty much, that my once brilliant procedure had something like a million holes in it. Maybe that was why all those professors rejected me, but I prefer to think they were just being meanies. <laughs> and so then, over the course of seven long months, I slowly patched each and every one of those holes. And at the end, I ended up with one small paper sensor that costs three cents, and it takes five minutes to run. This makes it over 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than current methods of detection of pancreatic cancer. But also, so far in tests, it's 100% accurate. And also, it can detect the cancer in the earliest stage, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could lift the one's dismal pancreatic cancer survival rates from 5.5% to close to 100%, and would do similar for ovarian and lung. But it doesn't stop there. By shifting out that antibody, you can potentially detect any protein or any disease in the world, ranging from Alzheimer's to heart disease, other forms of cancer, even HIV AIDS. Now, through this, I realized a lot of really important things. And I realized two really important things that are blocking the democratization of innovation and really from having other kids like me doing these innovations. And the first of which is that 75% of the world's population, five out of every seven people, lack the basic tool to do scientific research. They lack the access to the internet. 
You see, the internet is this amazing tool that empowers us to really spread these ideas and improve our conditions. And through the internet, anything is possible. Theories can be shared, and you don't have to be a professor with multiple degrees to have your ideas valued. You can be a high school kid like me. Regardless of your age, your gender, your ethnicity, any of that, it doesn't matter. It's just your ideas that count. And so through the internet, we can really emerge from this delicate fragmentation of nations as one united human body for the betterment of humanity and really make a difference in the world. And that, to me, is why I believe that the internet should be a basic human right, the virtual human right. And the second thing that I found is that was really blocking innovation around the world is the fact that when you're trying to access a knowledge on the internet, a lot of it's locked behind a paywall. For example, during my research, I had to spend hours and hours on the internet and hundreds of dollars trying to get access to these basic articles for basic background research. And this isn't just a problem for a 15-year-old kid. This is a problem for everyone. Recently, Harvard University released a statement stating, major periodical subscriptions, especially to electronic journals published by historically key providers, cannot be sustained. Continuing these subscriptions on their current footing is financially untenable. Now, what does it say about the world of academic publishing, accessibility of knowledge, and the flow of information? When Harvard University, the richest academic institution in the world, cannot afford to continue paying for its subscriptions, which are vital to its life-saving innovations. This is an atrocity, that people cannot have access to their information online. These scientific journals have commoditized the most valuable resource in the world, scientific knowledge. They're basically discriminating based on how much wealth you have. If you don't have enough money to buy an article, then you don't get that article, you don't get that knowledge, and that prevents billions of innovations. That, to me, is an atrocity. That, to me, is violating a basic human right, that not all of us can have access to the same information, that you're discriminating based on your wealth. This tier-based approach to scientific knowledge is extremely harmful to this entire world of science. Scientific research benefits from the open sharing of knowledge, not from locking it be tightly behind these paywalls. So when you deny open access, you're denying people like me the ability to innovate. You're leaving behind billions of future and potential innovators. You're preventing innumerable amounts of world-changing innovations. The minds of people must be free, and that means the minds of everyone, not the minds of the select few that have enough money to pay for this. Now, in order to solve these problems, we need to act as a whole. Not a singular person can solve them. We, as a human race, must realize that this is an extremely dire problem, and that when people can't innovate, then there is inequality. And that is not right, in my opinion. And we do have the power. <laughs> we do have the power to fix this. Because think, if a 15-year-old who didn't even know what a pancreas was could find a new way to detect pancreatic cancer, just imagine what we all can do. Thank you.